जोसेफ इज ऑल्सो देर so before we go to the academic thing i will request uh, tanmay choudhury who is from indore he will just give a brief how the book program will go then uh, sachin will take over thank you yeah okay <clears throat> so today uh, we are having something on young arthritic knee which is very common we are very orthopedicians uh, opd usually see such kind of patients where patients come with some knee pain vague and then some sit trivial trauma and they land up <clears throat> into the pain progresses so uh this is it so focus is between the age group for 40 to 60 years of age group where we would look be looking mostly about the middle compartmental osteoarthritis root tears the varus malalignment what to do about it and associated patellofemoral osteoarthritic changes so in a whole we would be looking in overview of the <coughs> young arthritic knee so which uh, the main pain which starts off which starts off from the root tears initially the pain is of the osteoarthritic pain but then later on uh, the, when there is some trivial trauma the pain increases so just about a brief about the root tears so we already know about all these things that really the mrt is lead to early de cartilage degeneration the posterior roots are affected more than the anterior ones the posterior lateral meniscal roots are mostly associated with the acute acl in young males while on the other hand the posterior medial meniscus root tears are mostly in the degenerative joints which we are going to talk about today and usually they are most common in the middle aged women and they comprise mostly of 21.5% of the posterior horn of the middle meniscus tears so that's quite a number so we are talking about quite a number of those patients today so they usually would land up with knee pain <coughs> and fourth fifth decade of life they are talking about with some trivial trauma which i already told they would present with some joint line pain mostly females so i would hand over to i would invite dr sachin tapaswi to take over from here and discuss about the all the surgical options in such kind of scenario thank you thank you so much uh, tanmay for this uh, lovely introduction and indeed as we discuss more about what our uh, whole my god yeah what why am i not seeing this now so one second i am just going to take like one minute because for some reason uh, zoom will okay that's fine okay i just hope i can do a screen share now yeah i can now okay fine so i think what is the key and critical yeah so the key and critical point here is to try and choose the optimal procedure so when we are talking about this young arthritic person who has come to us with arthritis we are going to exclude for the purposes of presentation any form of non surgical treatment so we will not be touching upon non surgical treatment such as taking medication doing any form of bracing or any injections in this particular webinar we'll be focusing predominantly on the surgical treatment and amongst the surgical treatment we're going to be looking predominantly on the aspect of doing joint preservation i know a lot of you would say that why i am i not going to be discussing meniscus root repairs in this particular webinar here the reason being is that we going to be having the meniscus root repair to be discussed as a separate topic or a separate webinar in itself when we come to the second meniscus webinar which is essentially on advanced meniscus repair techniques so for the purpose of uh, not doing repetition i am going to restrict myself 
to doing and choosing essentially the optimal procedure when we are looking at someone who has got medial compartment arthritis so i think friends is important to understand when lot of people like myself uh, dr sundarajan dr prateek dr samanta and dr ips have crossed over into the next decade we still consider ourselves to be young so 55 is the new 40 and i think uh, that gives us a lot of boost when we think about it when you look at me probably you will say other way around that uh, 40 is the new 55 but when you look at my colleagues ips and sundar probably i think they would also put a 60 year old to shame so i think it's very really important in today's world especially with the prevailing covid situation that people start investing in health and that's why we tend to push ourselves more and more so let's take this first example this is a 48 year old lady she's a homemaker she's got bilateral knee pain her left knee is more painful than the right and the x ray that i've shown you today here in front of you is that of her left knee of course this pain interferes with her quality of life she's got decent preserved range of motion from 2 to 135 degrees she's got medial joint line tenderness and she does give history that all about 6 to 8 months ago she had a trivial injury while getting up while she was sitting on the low surface following which she had a pain effusion which settled and this went on progressing here's another example he's a 51 year old male he's an agriculturist he works in the fields he goes up and down he's had a twisting injury to his knee joint about 2 years ago but due to pressures then he kept carrying on and he presents with bilateral knee pain his right is being more than the worse and it interferes with his quality of living has got medial joint line tenderness with almost the same preserved range of motion so what we can see here is probably both of them have got sequelae of a torn meniscus and then it has produced and progressed to form what we call see in our clinic as the most common entity which is medial compartment osteoarthritis so the question do we answer is that all are all tibiofibril medial compartment osteoarthritis alike so do they deserve the same treatment and i think the answer is absolutely no especially for the so called young athletic or the middle aged athletic individual or middle aged active individual if i may say so all medial compartment osteoarthritis are not alike and if we dwell into the pathology we have three main groups of these problems you can either have medial compartment arthritis as a result of malunited intraarticular fractures you may have them as a result of a neglected ligament injury or a neglected medial meniscus tear root tear or you could have idiopathic medial compartment arthritis and for all of these we have different solutions the first two categories are best treated by doing a realignment osteotomy but the third one which is the idiopathic osteoarthritis may be treated by either of these three methods and i think it is now your independent judgment as to what you feel is the best treatment modality when you go ahead and sort out the treatment for all these three patients so the first thing that you need to understand is what does the knee look like you need to examine the patient's gait you need to see how he walks and you need to understand is the knee stable or not and when you look at these things we're going to be looking at three main options and this patient either deserves an osteotomy he deserves either a partial knee replacement or one may argue that he deserves a total knee replacement doing an arthroscopy for such a patient who's got an osteoarthritic knee is definitely not an option anymore so i'll go through my sort of mental algorithm as to how i tackle these patients and the first thing that i want to rule out is that does this patient have inflammatory arthritis if there is any evidence of any inflammatory arthritis then definitely these two procedures are out and the only procedure that you should be looking for is to do a full knee replacement with a sinovectomy if required at an appropriate date as and how the patient may require so that's the first thing the second thing is that you want to evaluate how this patient is and when you start evaluating such patients you need to have them investigated properly you need to have good long leg scanogram films you need to do stress x rays you need to have mr scans as well and the first question that you need to answer is that is this knee stable so the same patient that i showed showed, uh, showed in the gait pattern i can see 
that he's got a chronic ACL laxity. So along with a meniscus tear, he's got a lax ACL as well. And whenever you have someone who's got any form of laxity or instability of his collaterals or his cruciates, then the partial knee goes out. So whenever you have ligamentous laxity, then depending upon the severity, you either have to choose between an osteotomy or between a total knee replacement. But do these ligament laxities behave the same? Here you see an arthroscopic view of someone who's got anteromedial osteoarthritis. You can very nicely observe that the osteoarthritic process is in the anterior and the mid compart medial compartment and the ACL is completely intact. So when the ACL is intact, the wear pattern on the medial side of the tibia would be that of anteromedial osteoarthritis or AMOA. And this is grade four AMOA as you see here in the presence of an intact ACL, which completely sort of gives you to the clue as to what sort of laxity pattern or wear pattern there would be. And the lateral compartment looks completely pristine, which is seen right here. On the other hand, here is a patient with a chronic ACL deficiency. You can see that there is no ACL. And what do we see here? That the wear pattern is now completely posteromedial. So the moment the ACL tears, there is subluxation of the tibia. And then you need to change from doing a partial knee to doing an osteotomy with or without a concomitant ACL reconstruction. And this patient required nothing short of a lateral closing wedge osteotomy with slope correction in which we decrease the slope and a concomitant ACL reconstruction at the same time. So remember, if you have ligamentous laxity, your go-to procedure should be probably an osteotomy rather than do any form of arthroplasty. But what is more important is that when you have gross laxity due to disruption of ligaments with advanced osteoarthritis, then you're better off doing a total knee replacement and you may need to be, make provision for using a constrained type of an implant. So let's come back to this patient one more time. And the next thing that you want to do or understand is that is the arthritis bone on bone? And why is it so important to understand whether it is bone on bone? Well, if it is not bone on bone and you end up doing a partial knee replacement, then you have a six to eight fold higher risk of revision. So you should not be doing a partial knee replacement if there is no bone on bone disease. And the converse also holds true that if you do an osteotomy for a bone on bone disease, then you are less likely to have a complete resolution of symptoms, which is what we must understand. We should also understand if the deformity is correctable. If the deformity is correctable, it gives us a clue. What is the state of the ACL as what is the state of the MCL? If the ACL is intact, then I think the deformity is correctable. When the ACL tears, then there is anterior subluxation of the tibia, which leads to a posterior wear of the tibial side, which leads to a contracted MCL, which leads to a persistently sort of contracted MCL. And for these patients, you are better off not doing a partial knee replacement. So if the MCL is contracted, then you're better off doing either a, a HTO with the release of the MCL or a TKR. If the MCL is normal, then you can do either of these three procedures. But if the MCL is deficient, you definitely need a total knee replacement with some form of constraint built into it. What about obesity? It's not uncommon that we see obese patients in our clinical practice. I think when I look at myself in the mirror, I am reminded of the same. So obesity is a definite contraindication for anyone to have uh, osteotomy because an osteotomy in the presence of a BMI that is higher than 35 is likely to produce poorer results. You're better off doing either a partial or a total. And recent literature does show that in the presence of, an OB, in the presence of BMI that is higher than 45, a partial knee replacement also works. What about activity level? So you have some people like uh, Dr. Sundar and Dr. IPS that are extremely active. And on the other hand, there are people like myself and probably Swarnendu who are less active. So for people like us who are less active, probably an arthroplasty is a better option. But if Sundar or IPS comes with medial compartment arthritis, because he's going to stay active, 
i think i'm going to want to propose to him that we do an osteotomy to help his medial compartment arthritis last but not the least we also want to look at the status of the patellofemoral joint and though the patellofemoral joint may be hidden from your view it's important to see the status of the pf joint because we will be hearing some very nice talks later on by dr clement joseph when he talks to us as to how what strategies he has to tackle patellofemoral joint arthritis so friends it's important to understand and remember that you just can't be a fanatic who who won't change your mind and who won't change the subject because unfortunately as of today orthopedics is a bit of fanatism people are hooked on to being either arthroplasty surgeons or they want to be joint preservation surgeons or they want to be arthroscopy surgeons but i think the person who is going to be the wisest amongst them all is the one who is going to have an open mind and who's going to suggest to the world that i think we need a bit of everything and you need to be actually a jack of all and also a master of all because a jack will definitely progress to a master and that is where the real success lies it's time that we all become knee surgeons and not just arthroscopy or arthroplasty surgeons because the continuum of care is probably the most important aspect when we treat our patients and it's not uncommon now that being in practice for the last 20 25 years i've had patients on whom i've done an arthroscopy and then have done some form of joint preservation and probably if i still hang in around for another couple of years i may also do a replacement on them so it all depends upon understanding the continuum of care and i think this is the basis on which we'll have discussion in this webinar thank you very much thank you sachin as usual excellent and nice talk and the uh, nice explanation of uh, why we are arthroscopic surgeon along with we are doing the replacement surgeon so your justification was quite good and excellent such a just a question here i mean can you by an x ray diagnose an anterior medial osteoarthritis yes i think uh, we now have good criteria where if you look at a true lateral view with both lines uh, with with both condyles overlapping mm -hmm. the thing that we need to check is the wear pattern on the tibia if mm -hmm. on the tibia you see a wear pattern in which the defect appears anteriorly and the posterior joint line appears normal that would suggest that there is anterior medial osteoarthritis on the contrary if the wear pattern on the true lateral film is posterior and or if the tibia is subluxed anteriorly it will demonstrate the presence of a posterior medial osteoarthritis so that could be one very good clue on the basis of which you could decide the same is there a role is there a role of a posterior anterior uh, knee flexion view or rosenberg view Still? so yes so that's another good point so a shoes view or a rosenberg view will show you the posterior joint so essentially when you do a standing ap x ray you're seeing more of the anterior joint yeah, yeah. if one wants to see the posterior joint then you should either do a rosenberg view which is a standing pa view in 45 degrees of knee flexion mm -hmm. with the x ray beam angled at 15 degrees or the french have described what is called as a shoes view which is made in 30 degrees of knee flexion 30, yeah. so essentially what you do is that you bring the posterior joint line parallel to the x ray beam and thereby you can also estimate the same very well uh, just a question again i mean sorry uh, uh, how can you clinically diagnose uh, that acl is not functioning uh, before you decide for a partial knee replacement So I think the first and foremost thing is that you want to look at a good clinical examination. You want to, uh, with your very good clinical examination skills, you'll be able to elicit any form of instability which may be there. But one must try and understand that you make it a false negative here, yeah. because if you have the presence right. of osteophytes, then these osteophytes will not allow for a good clinical examination yeah. and may not unmask the ACL instability. so in those cases you will need to rely on your radiography and maybe an mri scan if the need be to ascertain your diagnosis so you would always do an arthroscopy before an osteotomy so okay. if i'm if i'm doing an osteotomy i will always take the chance and do an arthroscopy at the same time yeah, yeah. it helps me tackle any intra articular pathology which may be there which i think probably will benefit the patient definitely so yeah. this is the message from the forum i think the if you do the high table osteotomy if you plan for arthroscopy is mandatory otherwise you should not go 
Uh, we, uh, let's not say it is mandatory. We would mandatory, say mandatory. that it is a useful <laughs> adjunct. So you may be able to confirm your pre-clinic, uh, pre-clinical findings, as well as you will be able to tackle any intraarticular pathology if at all you see any. So Sachin, my Sachin, question you direct to yeah. so Sachin: Have you ever? Uh, do you now recommend that you do HTO without doing arthroscopy? So I think uh, in the odd situation where I am dealing with a malunited intraarticular fracture and I want to do, I'm doing simply nothing more than an intrafocal osteotomy. Probably I may not do an arthroscopy because if I put my scope in, I'm going to get so scared looking at all the chondral damage and all the disaster that is there inside the joint that probably I might just chicken out. But otherwise, almost always, I have the tool, I have the skill it yeah. may not take more than 10 15 minutes of surgical time so why not do the needful yeah yeah that's the recommendation yeah yes sundar you had a you had a comment uh, 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 no i want to ask a question i know when you are, do a high tibial osteotomy uh, do you have any gender uh, issues like you no know, when you see a female with the same kind of arthritis they are fit for a high tibial osteotomy is the age of 40 uh, do you have any uh, so, different uh, opinion for male and female. So I think that's a great question. Uh, Bhushan, I think, will be shedding a lot more light on it when he comes to his talk about osteotomy. But I'll just quickly give you my uh, uh, opinion on the same. Uh, if I see that uh, there is a bone-on-bone -bone disease in a female, I would prefer to do a partial knee over an osteotomy. I mean, we're looking at uh, idiopathic uh, osteoarthritis. We're not looking at post-ligamentous laxity. But uh, of course, if she fits the criteria, she's motivated, her BMI is not high, and she has got, uh, maybe she's not bone on bone, then I would definitely do an osteotomy for her. Yeah. I don't think the results are any inferior in a female than a male, unless and until, you know, you've not picked out the right indication. Yeah, Tanmay, you want to make a comment? Yeah, Dr. Trivedi wants to make a comment. Yes, yeah. Sanjay. Sachin, um, when you take a decision about unicondylar, uh, do you th think the angle of varus maximum you can compensate with that in your otherwise normal ligamentous pain? So, uh, Sanjay, there is viruses coming from two sources. There is an intraarticular source, there is an extraarticular source. The extraarticular source is your tibia vara, which we cannot correct with a partial knee replacement. What you can correct with the unicompartmental knee replacement is only the intraarticular varus, which is as a result of cartilage loss and as a result of meniscus loss. So you'll be able to correct and restore the intraarticular varus. You will not be able to correct any extraarticular deformity. Any specific age bar for choosing between osteotomy and UKR? I mean, where would you think? Because th there are multiple variables to decide over whether this or that. But then yeah. there are people, there are females that are short, we are at younger age, maybe around 48, 49, that mark with high BMI, where you can't really do an osteotomy. Would you really think for going over to doing a, a, a joint preservation or directly go with the UK? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, probably I see myself doing more unis in uh, obese females who are over the BMI of 35, who have got a uh, uh, medial meniscus root tear staying there for about three to four months they are still not bone on bone disease yet but the MR scan does suggest that they have got grade four chondral changes on their medial femoral condyle and I know that probably they are not the ones that I'm going to be able to help by doing a joint preservation surgery such as a root repair along with an osteotomy essentially because they do not satisfy the criteria of a high tibial osteotomy and probably I would then suggest that they would go for a partial knee. But uh, Tanmay, I'd love uh, to bring up this question once Bhushan is done with his talk, when he discusses the same, and it will be a very nice discussion as to whether uni or HTO is probably the way to go. Pratik, is, one last Pratik, question. Pratik, Pratik, Pratik is waiting, Tanmay. Pratik is waiting. Okay, yeah. okay, please go ahead. Yeah, there was one comment that arthroscopy, we are able to see the other joint also and reconfirm as... Uh, um, uh, Sachin said, for arthroscopy, then you can do the lateral compartment and petrofemoral also for any surprises. Secondly, a question to Sachin. Sachin, uh, any uh, range of movement uh, criteria for between the osteotomy and uh, um, uh, unicompartment for this age group? You know, the movements available at the joint? 
Yeah, so I think uh, Bhushan will put uh, shed more light on this. But uh, any one who has got a fixed flexion contracture of fifteen uh, degrees plus is not a good candidate for doing. Is not a good candidate for having either an HTO or a partial knee replacement. Mm -hmm. If you see the presence of a very large anvil osteophyte, which you feel is the one that is blocking the complete extension, then yes, probably you may consider that to be an extended indication. As regards flexion. so flexion you will be able uh, to achieve decent flexion after both of these procedures and this gain in flexion is going to be completely dependent upon your pre op flexion of course there are going to be additional uh, things to look at such as posterior osteophytes etc which may lead or which may be responsible for loss of flexion angle but all the same it is very uncommon to see someone who would be considered for an osteotomy or a partial knee replacement who has got a stiff knee with restricted flexion beyond 70 or 80 degrees probably in our judgment these people will straight on go for a total knee replacement because they'll be quite disabled for the same correct yeah and my we can move ahead and my yeah we can move ahead just one last okay. question from the audience there's one question by dr sun sachin please explain what is bone on bone disease that's so, already yeah so that's a thank you for that question so bone on bone means that there is complete loss of articular cartilage and when you do a single leg standing weight bearing film you see absolutely no cartilage space at all so that is what is termed as bone on bone disease thank you so thank you so much uh, thank you thank you so much we'll uh, so next uh, lecture would be taken by dr bhushan I'll start sharing my screen now. Yeah, yeah. Well, hello all. Uh, I'm Bhushan yeah. Sabdis, and this talk is on heart evil osteotomies, various types, and which and when as a treatment choice or treatment option for. Uh, of various medial compartment arthritis in fairly fit young patients or for that matter in any patient per se so this is a small video of someone who has proper typical thrust uh, age 45 severe pain on the medial side of the knee joint and these uh, sort of uh, show the ideal patients that you can help with a heart evil osteotomy now we all know arthritis is a progressive disease and we are having an epidemic of a relatively younger population developing severe arthritis the medial compartment arthritis is usually associated with various deformity in the knee joint and this is a self fueling engine so this is a vicious circle of a various arthritis because of the progressive various the adduction movement increases the weight bearing axis shifts more medially which causes further medial collapse and further various so this circle keeps on going unless you block it somewhere the arthritis is going to progress the joint is going to sublux and the patient is going to need a total knee replacement at a younger age so the whole principle of doing something to improve uh, or something to break this circle is osteotomy we all know about the natural alignment and how the weight bearing axis which is the mechanical axis of the lower limb passes through the center of the knee normally and when it passes beyond mid uh, one half of the medial compartment that's when the patients usually start getting symptoms i'm not talking about constitutional varus i'm talking about medial compartment arthritis when and progressive various deformity so we owe a lot to uh, this gentleman about the understanding of the deformities and we all know about the cora and all those things and importantly enough the cora for a medial compartment arthritis lies in the joint and in the metaphysis of the tibia so it is sort of an ideal situation where you can correct the deformity at that spot without having much of transpatient issues and get a good alignment and these two angles the mpta and ldfa are the ones which are important in giving you uh, uh, an idea about where the deformity lies and what happens now uh, the management of arthritis of course is like a traffic signal you have the joint preservation in the green zone joint replacement in the yellow zone and joint salvage in the red zone try and stay in the green zone as far as possible because the moment you start going in the yellow zone it's irreversible process so if you can save the joint and stay in the green zone especially in younger population 
around 50 as sachin said 60 is new 40 so till the time of 60 as much uh, i will say if you can do an osteotomy and get them back to their normal lifestyle without changing the joint they are much happier the partial joint replacement can be considered both in yellow and green zone because uh, depending on your mindset you can think of it as a joint preservation or you can think of it as a joint replacement now why do you do osteotomy so you are going to unload the damaged area of the knee joint in this case the medial compartment of the knee you are going to retension the medial ligament so the mcl will be retention because of the corrected alignment the range of motion usually tends to improve and it can be used as an adjunct for other procedures so you can use it uh, along with your meniscal repairs you can use it when you have a uh, revision acl or pcl injury with various mal alignment you can use it with cartilage procedures so it's important to plan the surgery properly and that's the key for the whole thing now you all of you know about the leaning tower of pisa and the lot of treatment plans were thought of uh, when you are correcting it and this is opening wedge osteotomy that uh, would have worked ideally but it's not that simple in this case so various planes can be altered by changing the alignment so you can play with the knee slope you can play with medial lateral alignment and even rotational alignment by doing osteotomy so it's a very versatile tool but first and most important thing after your clinical assessment is planning the osteotomy you need to get a proper hidden scanogram i am a strong believer of software planning for these surgeries uh, you can of course do planning along with uh, a, a tracing paper uh, which is absolutely fine but a software planning is much more accurate in my opinion uh, again we are looking at the mldfa uh, and mpta which are the main two angles which define the nature of deformity and where the correction needs to be done any various uh, leads to tibial osteotomy is a wrong notion so you need to be aware that there might be deformity in the femur which can be contributing to various and these patients do disastrously bad if you do an hto in these patients so make sure that you plan the surgery properly and uh, get the surgery done before all of this you need a properly done scanogram uh, there are a lot of places still where a good scanogram is still not available or I've, i've spoken to people who do scanogram in the lying down position they get a ct scanogram which is not at all import not at all sufficient to give you the the the, the, the exact idea about the deformity so the x ray beam has to be at the level of the knee joint it has to be at a fixed distance like 300 cm from the joint there has to be a calibration marker inside you need to adjust for pelvic obliquity and leg length so you can't have a pelvic com- pelvis line completely oblique or one leg short and one leg long so you need to adjust for that and the most important the key step is the patellae facing forward so you should get the scanogram in such a way that you see the patellae as a central circle between the two condyles of the femur so don't worry about the feet element the feet can be in external rotation or internal rotation that doesn't make a difference your alignment of the patellae is the key here so some of the scanograms which should not accept is something like this so it's a stitch scanogram that means they have taken two three different x-rays and they have combined it together and this doesn't work so if your radiographer is not experienced he will give something like this which will give you a completely wrong idea of uh, the kind of deformity uh, the same scanogram when done properly looks like the one on the right side but if you look at the central scanogram you will realize the importance of patella i'm showing the patella in the bang in the middle of the knee joint here and you see the foot the foot is completely rotated internally but this is a true scanogram to ap scanogram with patellae bang in the center so this is what you should expect and any of you who are doing osteotomy should speak to your radiographers to get a properly done perfectly calibrated scanogram so this scale that i placed here it corresponds to 305 cm so it works perfectly fine in my hands when i'm planning surgeries uh, for correcting deformities um, of course we know there is opening wedge there is closing wedge and uh, there are other ways dome osteotomy is another ways so let me just uh, touch that a bit so my favorite of course is of opening wedge osteotomy uh, things have improved drastically with the newer locking systems uh, the lax screws help in compressing the hinge nicely and uh, i can show you hundreds of images of my osteotomies using either a new clip system a peak power plate uh, uh, an otc plate or a tomofix plate so this is one of my favorite surgeries for uh, any kind of medial compartment arthritis who are Uh, fulfilling all the criteria of selection on the other hand the closing wedge osteotomy involves taking a piece of bone out from the lateral side 
uh, along with the fibula osteotomy to correct the deformity. Well, it looks quite an attractive option, uh, but and it's a, a fairly stable constraint as well. So you can fix it with a simple Coventry staple, or you can fix it with a locking plate on the lateral side, and that usually gives a fairly nice correction of the proximal tibia. But there are lots of pros and cons about opening wedge and closing wedge osteotomies. So let's just go through it quickly. So opening wedge is we are relying on bone regeneration. That means we are creating new bone. In the, in the closing wedge, you're taking out bone. In opening wedge, you're not doing a fibular osteotomy and there is no chance of a CPN palsy. Having said that, I have one patient uh, who had a CPN palsy due to a tight application of a Clotron calf pump uh, stocking on, on that side, fortunately transient and recovered completely. So these are main three pluses on the side of opening wedge. It does cause lengthening, which is generally helpful for most patients because their leg is shortened and it, they go back to the normal length. And believe me, a lot of patients who have had bilateral HTOs have told me that they're really happy that taller by a centimeter and a half, one and a half centimeter. And they generally like that. Uh, the downside of opening wedge osteotomy is that you need a very stable fixation. Uh, unlike a closing wedge, which is stable by itself, you need a very good system. And that's why opening wedges were not in vogue till about the year 2000, uh, after which the tomofix and the locking plate principles came in. And that changed the ball game completely. Opening wedge does take time to heal. So you need to give it time to heal, unlike a closing wedge where the bones are opposing and it heals pretty fast. Opening wedge tends to increase the slope of the tibia and exactly opposite happen in closing wedge. So your ligaments come into play here. So if you have an ACL deficient knee, an opening wedge may not be a good option. And if you have a PCL deficient knee, a closing wedge need not, uh, will not work as well. But again, that's a very uh, minor issue. You can play with the slope really well with the opening wedge osteotomy as well. The key thing here is that it maintains the shape of the tibia for any required future TKR, which does not happen with a closing wedge. You get a funny shaped tibia and quite a few times you need to use an offset stem on the tibial side just to get the align, just to get the tibia fixed properly. Uh, one last thing, uh, an opening wedge tends to cause patella baha. A closing wedge may cause patellata. Not every time does it cause patellata. But again, there are ways in which you can play with it and avoid getting a patella baha with an opening wedge osteotomy. So I still prefer an opening wedge osteotomy in all of my patients or most of my patients. You can see the X-ray of a badly done HTO, closing wedge HTO, and everything has fallen apart. So that is something which is not good. So just going back to the same analogy of your PISA tower. So what you will need to do it's take a piece off from that tower and then get it straight. But you have misshaped it. It doesn't look as good as it was before. So I don't think that is a good option in general. Uh, with the newer locking plate systems, you get really good fixation and healing is generally a given. Uh, I have one patient who had non-union in all of my patients that I've done, uh, I've done in the last uh, 10 odd years. And uh, that was also infected non -union. So it's very rare to have a non-union. There are a few delayed unions, especially in bigger corrections, but they tend to heat. It can be a very versatile tool. You can play with the slope. You can increase the slope. You can decrease the slope. And it is very helpful to align the, the slope whichever way you want based on your ligamentous requirement. Uh, um, an important key event, uh, key structure of uh, uh, an opening weight osteotomy is adjustable correction. In a closing wedge, once the wedge is taken off, you have to close the osteotomy. Of course, you can leave a small gap, but that defeats the purpose as such. But an opening wedge, you can decide if you want to open more or open less. So it is something which you have in your hands when you're doing the osteotomy on table. And the anatomy is preserved for future TKR. So that's the reason I generally prefer opening wedge osteotomy. I would still go for a closing wedge osteotomy in some patients. The main ones who are chronic smokers who are not able to give up smoking. And I usually say if they are uh, off smoking for three months, I would I, I, I would allow them to have an opening wedge osteotomy. There are some uh, uh, nuts out there who, who carry on smoking and they're not keen on an opening wedge osteotomy. Uh, and then I, in those patients, I would do a closing wedge osteotomy. In some patients, either due to DDH, as you can see in the scanogram here, 
uh, or due to post polio paralysis on the opposite side there is already a contralateral shortening such as this patient and in these patients i think a closing wedge is better because sometimes these are walkers that means they are able to walk unaided and the balance gets tipped if you lend them the good leg and they are not able to walk again so that is a very important thing you need to keep in mind you don't want to lend them the good leg in these patients that will just offset the balance and uh, i have a, uh, one or two patients who were not able to walk properly afterwards and they ended up requiring a caliper on the opposite side which wasn't required till then and lastly syndromic or pediatric uh, cases sorry syndromic or pediatric cases i would uh, i would uh, uh, sorry Uh, in severe osteoporosis, I will consider a, a closing weight osteotomy as well. Fortunately, with the current methods of treatment, such as uh, uh, hormonal treatment, your bisphosphonates, or uh, even your teriparatides, this can be corrected within a, within a few months. So, generally, is not required. What about external fixators? Uh, external fix fixators are pretty famous, and some people swear by it. Uh, uh, I have. Uh, seen people doing it for mandibular surgery and i have a lot of colleagues and lot of friends who believe uh, very much in doing uh, external fixation surgery for uh, for hdos i work with anand joshi who himself had a elizaro fixator done in front of the bombay orthopedic society meeting by drawer pal himself in 98 99 so it does work i'm not against that but uh, like session we attended the last year's baltimore deformity correction course and dr hersenberg was there himself and he also mentioned that if given a choice he would correct all the deformities using internal fixation and not the external fixation because patients are generally not happy with the external fixation and the in the chances of pin track infection are so high in india uh, i've seen so many patients that uh, i used to do elizaro in past and i used to, I used to see so many patients with persistent oozing and pin track infections and you're always worried if the infection stays dormant but any future surgery will activate them and that will again be a disaster for these patients so external fixators are generally preserved for special scenarios such as this where there is no skin left on the medial side which is good skin to go through uh, in patients who have peripheral vascular disease in actually in patients with peripheral vascular disease elizaro tends to help in increasing the blood supply of the leg as well so uh, an external fixator or elizaro with a good corticotomy and gradual correction might be a good idea in patients with peripheral vascular disease and of course with syndromic uh, or pediatric cases i think it's better to go for gradual correction uh, uh, especially if there is severe deformity like in blounds disease or something like that now for this patient he had a significant anterior medial uh, injury from the previous in, uh, uh, from the previous accident and this was a mild united tibia fracture i still did a hto went from posterior part of the tibia lifted the whole flap had a plastic surgeon on standby fortunately didn't require anything done and he's one of the happiest patients you get a good correction on day 1 and they are generally very happy that they you have given them a straight leg his leg length discrepancy improved and uh, he's walking around normally now so of course for someone like this this is a 14 year old girl i think uh, she's finished her growth now but i will not be keen to do uh, an hto it will be about 20 mm correction in a small 14 year old girl i think it's better to go for external fixators in these patients uh, as i said hto is very versatile surgery as such so a quick uh, example this is a mal united or mal treated tibial plateau fracture with a fixed lateral and posterior subluxation she was only 32 when she came to me sorry 28 when she came to me so this is a quite a bad injury per se but you could correct this by doing a good release on the media uh, on, on medial side of the tibia uh, all the way to the posterior part and get a good alignment and she just uh, this is about one year down the line and she sent me a photograph for a video of her playing dandiya uh, in in last uh, navratri so these patients also do very well when you are able to correct the deformity on table and i think opening wedge hto is much more versatile as compared to a closing wedge surgery as such uh one last thing of course all of you have heard about tcvo tcvo is tibial condylar valgus osteotomy i have become a big fan of it but not for all patients for patients who have really severe arthritis and who are not keen for a total knee replacement they don't have any significant rest pain or night pain 
and they're able to walk around, but they're bothered with the deformity. That's the planning on the right side of the screen where you can see how a TCDO works. So that's how your osteotomy is. So instead of going all the way through from the medial side to the hinge point, you do an L-shaped osteotomy and it opens up on the medial side. That gives a good fixation. So that's uh, this patient. So you can see a, a, a horizontal osteotomy halfway through and then a vertical osteotomy going to the intercondylar inter region. Ideally, it should go to the lateral spine, but the, the patellar tendon comes in the way. So I, I usually do it till the uh, intercondylar area. You put a wire through first, and as you open the osteotomy, you can see this wire bending. This is followed by fixation uh, with a standard tomopic plate, and you can correct massive deformities. I've corrected about 20 millimeters of uh, uh, HTO corresponds to opening wedge HTO corresponds to about 10, 11 millimeters of opening with a TCDO. So that's again a good option. What's important is to understand how to, to do osteotomies and how to select patients for osteotomies versus unicompartmental versus total knee replacement. Sachin did a brilliant talk on how unis and HTOs are uh, options in a uh, in, in, uh, younger age group. I would just say that unless there is grade four arthritis, do not think of doing a unicompartmental knee replacement for even though the patient is 65, and uh, he has grade two or grade three arthritis is significant whereas he or she will still do very well with a HTO. Coming to sex, I think uh, if all the criteria as discussed by Sachin are fulfilled, I would still go for HTO. HTO does better in males as compared to females. But you need to be aware of the newer ways in which you can correct the deformities and get the patients back to normal. I think uh, that's all I wanted to, wanted to say. Uh, continuing on the uh, same line from Sachin, I think we all need to start running than flying now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bhushan. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I think before we go to the other talk of Clement, uh, can we maybe have some questions or uh, because these two are talks which are uh, quite relevant. So if we can start the uh, discussion uh, till uh, Clement is preparing his uh, presentation. Uh, Bhushan, hey, yes. uh, do, yeah, we should do. Yes, you, yeah, do you uh, consider some amount of ligament laxity in the correction as well? So, if the knee is having some kind of ligament laxity, so while so, calculating your angle for correction, do you consider so, that ligament laxity or opening also? Yeah. So, so this this is where your joint line convergence angle comes in the way. So, if there is medial collapse and there is deformity extra articularly, that is in tibial metaphysis as well as in the joint then you have to subtract the correction you're doing in the joint from the actual correction you're applying in the HTO. So quite a few times, suppose your, your, your planning shows that your correction is going to be 12 millimeters. On table, what you find, the moment you release the MCL, you already got three or four millimeters, uh, three or four degrees of correction in that. Then you end up doing about seven to eight millimeter opening only. And that's why you need to check it on table with alignment rods. Whenever I'm doing the trauma CAD or uh, software planning, I put two osteotomies, one in the joint, which is soft tissue osteotomy, as I call it, and one at the normal osteotomy side. So I get the joint line convergence angle to normal by the soft tissue osteotomy, where I'm accounting for the MCL release, which will give me uh, a, a straight, uh, a, a less than two degrees of JCLA. And then I plan the other osteotomy. And this way, usually I uh, reduce my correction by about two millimeters from the actual planning that uh, is generally done. I uh, hope, there, hope that makes sense. Yeah, there, there, there are a couple of questions which are coming up. Uh, one question is to both maybe Bhushan and uh, uh, Sabnis, uh, Bhushan and Sachin both. Uh, any cartilage procedure, can you combine cartilage procedure if there is an ICRS grade three, four damage with an HTO? So you're doing an HTO, but are you doing some cartilage procedures also if there is a cartilage damage inside the joint? So both Sachin and Bhushan, I mean, both are Sachin, you go first. Yes, Sachin. Um, so I think uh, there are two parts to this question. Part A is that <clears throat> the patient, you have treated the patient with a primary chondral pathology and on investigation that you find that he is not in proper alignment. That is the first way to look at it. And the second is that you are doing it for a malaligned limb and on an arthroscopy or preoperatively, you also see that he has a chondral pathology. So I think both of these are two different um, scenarios. I'll give you an example. If uh, I had this girl who was about 21 years old, she had a OCD 
which uh, for which she was seeking treatment and she was malaligned so in her the treatment was predominantly for the chondral pathology and i did a multi or two or three plug um, oct for her but if your cartilage treatment has to succeed the limb has to be aligned so i did a realignment osteotomy at the same time on the other hand you are doing a osteotomy for someone who is malaligned and you discover on a uh, on your arthroscopy that there is grade 2 or grade 3 fraying in that case i would definitely do the minimal possible thing to this particular lesion by doing some form of a marrow stimulation if i find it is a traumatic focal defect then depending upon the size of the lesion i would treat it according to its merits bhushan you want to add anything to that or add to yeah anything? so yeah. so generally speaking it depends on what the patient presents with if you are treating a cartilage defect then osteotomy is done as an adjunct but if you are doing osteotomy primarily uh, and uh, just when you are scooping you find something in the joint uh, unless it's a loose chondral flap i will not do much apart from a microfracture or uh, 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 i won't even venture to say oaks at this juncture because more for a localized defect but if it's a ocd if it's a recurrent meniscal tear if it's a revision acl or pcl surgery then osteotomy is generally is done as an adjunct so i think cartilage procedure then is a primary thing and osteotomy is done to save your cartilage procedure not the other way around i think great uh, dr mukul koshal has got a question he says uh, what is the software you are using right now for uh, this uh, osteotomy so, the cad can you suggest the name they they just so, want to is uh, so it on I, an android you, based or a, 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 a Mac based. So this is an Android-based uh, app. This is called as Trauma CAD, and that's done by Brain Lab, and that's a very versatile software. Even Sachin was asking me about how I plan an osteotomy in the joint. Can I share the screen for a second? Yeah, makes sense. I think because uh, people, yeah, there are two more questions. And everybody wants to know about the Trauma CAD, which is. Uh, I'll just show. Tra so Trauma CAD is something that uh, even I've been using uh, for a while now. essentially it's a paid thing that you take from brain lab and uh, if you want we can share the details with you uh, for uh, brain lab and i think the the user fee is about 1 and 1/2 lakhs for one year okay yeah. so it contains uh, software for whatever h2 so osteotomy is pediatric pkr so you can plan your joints yeah, your yeah, joints yeah, yeah. so just one example you can see this uh, patient's deformity here So this opening on the lateral side, collapse on the medial side. So the first osteotomy is dropped here. Do I have two minutes? I can show you live on the Trauma Cat software if it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll show you in a second. Then just give me a minute. Uh, you can, Sachin, you can keep on talking if you want. I'll just yeah. I'll take the next question. Time. Yeah, you can yeah. take. I get the next question on IPS. In the meantime, that he pulls out his screen, he'll have to log into the Trauma Cat uh, program actually. Yes, Ranjit Sach was supposed to talk. One, Ranjit was asking some questions. Sundar was also there. Uh, Sachin. Yes. Is there the any tips? The... Okay. Okay. Uh, Sundar, you go. I will finish it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there any tips and tricks to uh, in the clinically or radiologically to differentiate the bone and bone disease? Because sometimes it is not very rare that when you go arthroscopy and see suddenly you are at bone and bone disease for the high tibial osteotomy. So, in the radiologically, how do you rule out this patient? Doesn't definitely is a grade two or three. Uh, so, the term bone on bone disease is a radiological term. It is not an arthroscopic term. So, if you are a single leg standing AP X-ray or a Rosenborg X-ray is bone on bone. It is bone on bone. That's it. If on arthroscopy you see grade four chondral lesions uh, in focal areas, then I will not consider it to be bone on bone per se. what that has implication is that when you have um, the degree of arthritis will influence you as to what degree of correction you want to do with your osteotomy so depending upon the degree of chondral wear you want to you may want to correct them to fujisawa point or less than the fujisawa point if it is not bone on bone yeah. so uh, guys i'm just doing a live uh, thing so this is going on as as i'm speaking so this is a uh, 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 i won't say the perfect scanogram but it's a scanogram which i think is acceptable for for this juncture so i'm just calibrating my image here so that's accepting the calibration now this is the deformity analysis as we are required to do so uh, bushod your bushod your screen is not moving i'm sorry 
uh, I thought I was sharing. No, no, no. The screen is not moving. It is on the JPEG image. You need to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So now you are in the trauma cat screen. Okay. Yeah. So on the trauma cat, I put the center of the head and the greater trochanter. Now uh, that point was wrong, but I'll do that in a second. Can you see so screen, the sir? That's the medial femoral condyle, lateral femoral condyle, medial tibial plateau, lateral tibial plateau, medial side and lateral side of the tibia. So that roughly gives you uh, your uh, alignment. This is a crude way. Of course, you are going to zoom it in and put the points perfectly. Just for the sake of clarity, what I'm going to do is increase the JCLA slightly so you can see. So that's your alignment at, at the junction now. Okay. Now, whenever, uh, just ignore other things. I'm just making a point on the intra-articular osteotomy at this juncture. So whenever you want to... Uh, uh, correct for this uh, joint line con uh, convergence angle that is eight in this case. So I want to make it zero. So what I'll do is I just put two lines here from the distal femur and the proximal tibia. And that gives me my position of the uh, osteotomy. So what I'm going to do is just bring that exactly in the joint. So I'll bring this Now, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll say finish and cut just now before putting the second osteotomy, just, just, just for the sake of it. So now, whenever I do this, I get my joint line convergence angle perfectly normal. So when that is zero or two degrees, then the residual deformity is the only thing which I need to be corrected. This is the intra-articular correction that you would achieve by doing uh, your MCL release. Am I clear? Yes, I think you are clear here. But, but Bhushan, there is an issue here. If the LCL is also lax, so you do have a laxity which is actually both... Doesn't make lax. any difference. The moment you get okay. the knee in valgus, the LCL will not be under stress. And it will, uh, I don't know if it shrinks or not, but it will not cause any problems to the patient. That okay. is because the tensile load on that MCL starts decreasing. So it does not contribute to the laxity then. And okay. Bhushan, if you can go back to your first screen where we the, before doing the uh, correction, mm -hmm. you just just show us the MPTA and the LDFA. I think uh, just go back and not do this uh, intraarticular osteotomy. Go right back first before doing all of this and back further back. So I think this is an important point which uh, you can see in this particular example here. What Bhushan has found out that in this particular uh, in this particular um, deformity, his uh, MLDFA is 93 or 94, his 92 yeah. degrees, yeah. and his uh, MPTA is 83 degrees. So this virus is not just only in the tibia; it is in the femur plus the tibia. And so you can see the same thing on the other side. This correct. is one side done already, and I did a I did a dual osteotomy on this patient on the other side also. So, so if exactly, you try, yeah. yeah, if you try and correct everything in the tibia here, you will end up in an oblique joint line and a poor result. So that is why the importance of planning cannot be underemphasized, uh, especially when we are dealing with a virus deformity. So this is a perfect example that will require a double level osteotomy to correct and realign his leg. So, so on the femoral side, it is around how much around? Uh... It should be 87. So there is 5 degree of deformity in the femur okay. and there is about 4 degree of deformity in the tibia. 4 to 5 degree yeah. in the tibia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you would always correct it or you would can accept an under correction sometimes? No. I think if you are doing an osteotomy, you have to get all the parameters in the green. I think I would accept uh, MPTA going to about 93, sometimes 94. I will not accept anything beyond that. Because that essentially means I'm getting a really oblique joint line. So my MPTA higher limit is 93, 94. But if there is deformity in the femur, uh, only if it's one or two degrees, I will ignore. But anything more than three degrees, I think it needs to be corrected. And there's a last question here. I mean, how exactly you play with that slope? You said you play with the slope while doing an open with just shortening. But can you yeah, play so, with it? So you make a trapezoidal gap uh, when you're opening the osteotomy. 
so your uh, lamina spreader is placed posterior and not in the mid part or anterior so when you open the ostotomy more posteriorly and less anteriorly you are flattening the slope if you want to increase the slope you place your lamina spreader anteriorly and then you can increase the slope of the ostotomy which is natural tendency for this ostotomy anyway so to keep the slope intact or if you want to increase the if you want to flatten the slope or reduce the slope you have to open the ostotomy more posteriorly and open it as a trapezoid rather than opening it as a rectangle okay uh i guess just one thing to add on and ask bhushan yeah, yeah. to clear the doubt and whatever to message to the uh, viewers that whenever we do the high tibial ostomy there is a natural tendency that the slope increases yes absolutely yes so you just give that the trick to the viewers so that they they don't make the mistake next time so uh, there Other are two things that, yeah. there are two things you can do one is before you start the surgery you place two parallel k wires one proximal and one distal to the ostotomy and make sure that they stay parallel at the end of the surgery so that that means you haven't changed the slope in any way uh, yeah. a second thing is to open the ostotomy in a trapezoidal shape by opening it more posteriorly less anteriorly and that is uh, pretty easily visible when you're opening the ostotomy that your ostotomy is opening like a triangle or a trapezoid rather than a rectangle and that is that is generally achieved only when you release the mcl properly if you are half hearted in your mcl release you will end up causing a, a reverse trapezoid shape and increasing the slope significantly bhushan uh, any any experience of a bone ninja app that's a question which has come up so bone ninja app i've tried my hands on in in uk in last uh, london ostotomy course it did look like a very good uh, app it is ipad based uh, i am more of an android guy and i'm quite happy with the trauma cad but if it's cheaper than trauma cad i won't yeah, mind this is mind, doctor mind, yeah, doctor prince has written this that this is cheaper and it does uh, this job it's i think it's, it's, it's another another good free app only to do osteotomies is called as osteomaster oh that okay. is a good one osteomaster okay perfect uh, there is one question from bangladesh uh, they say in bangladesh scanogram is not available so would you suggest us to do anything separate different i think uh, scanogram is essential uh, what can be done is you can stitch a scanogram so you can take x rays of uh, pelvis knee and ankle separately and then stitch them together the important thing to consider here is not to have calibration issues so the length between the patient the distance between the patient and the exit yeah. tube remains the same the tube is moved up and down and it has to be standing so uh, i heard someone saying that he has placed the x ray scan exit tube on the roof and the patient sleeps on the floor and if they get a x ray done i think that that's that's not the way to go for a scanogram yes that's that thing i want to just stress up on that whenever you have the proper scanogram it has to be a standing scanogram otherwise some people are doing the lying whatever they are yeah, doing yeah. this lying condition in the ct scan and they are telling i have done this scanogram for my measurement that is absolutely wrong because that's that scanogram right. has no value at all in an osteotomy scenario absolutely am i right yeah 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 Sachin knows one. better. Sachin knows better about this uh, thing than <laughs> me. We've had this discussion a lot of times before. Yeah, so I yeah. think it's, it's, these are the basic prerequisites for osteotomy. I think uh, just saying I don't have scanogram is not the way you have to do something to get it done. That's all. So uh, if Sachin, you want to do osteotomy, these are the basic prerequisites. Sachin, one last last trick trick from a uh, the osteotomy guru like you that when you are whenever you do osteotomy for your ligament deficiency. just one or two lines for the viewers just how, how you do your how you change your slope for acl and pcl okay so when you have an acl deficient knee you need to decrease the slope when you have a pcl deficient knee you need to increase the slope so that is the basic uh, mantra that you must understand and the ratio is 1 is to 2 so when you change the slope distance wise by 2 mm you achieve 1 degree change in correction so that is what you should remember and there is a very good paper by frank noise uh, i will uh, share it to you uh, samantha sir and then you can put it on the ias webinar uh, ios I ias uh, whatsapp group uh, that is a very good paper which tells us what is the rule of thirds when you are doing this slope correction okay so because last time in the cartilage meeting i was supposed to talk on this osteotomy to correct in the chronic ligament elasticity so uh -huh. that's why i want to learn from you the what you do yourself why are you pulling my leg sir <laughs> uh, do, do anybody of you still have the spherical ball uh, magnification marker when you take scales always 
always, always. it's compulsory always. otherwise yeah. you cannot calibrate your scanogram planning at all whether you're doing so all even for cad you need it yeah uh, so uh, so for yes. either you can have a spherical ball which is 2.54 cm in diameter you uh -huh. can have the grid which is 5 cm grid or you can have a scale whatever scale you use and you use it for every patient in uh, at a specific distance so uh, what i have done is the scale is fixed on the wall and the patient stands close to wall so then the calibration doesn't change much what we use is 10 rupee coin it is 2.52 oh wonderful i didn't know and we have okay. calibrated it to that <laughs> it's 2 rupee coin 10 rupee coin 10, 10 rupee coin cost costlier cost so those two or three people, two or three places where we stand for sanogram there is 10 rupee coin donated by us <laughs> so i think uh, dr prince had asked this question prince i think you got the answer so let us probably go to our next speaker uh, dr clement there one more question one more yeah, question one more one more one more is okay. waiting for a long okay so one of my question is answer the second question to bhushan is ki we all know in sto ki we require intact hinge and we are discussing not to break the hinge or fracture the hinge and off late we are discussing about a hinge wire or a hinge screw how often you are using that hinge wire or hinge screw and if at all uh, what are the direction how to use it can we throw some light so, about uh, i'm not a big fan of hinge screw yet i have seen two patients who had severe lateral pain for with a hinge screw but a hinge wire is a brilliant concept i think so it's a wire which is passed on the lateral side so you pass a wire from the medial cortex that means distal well distal to the osteotomy site and pass it at the hinge point laterally so you pass it along the lateral cortex of the tibia starting medially what it does it stops your osteotomy from progressing to the lateral cortex and it protects your hinge so i think uh, uh i think with experience your need for a hinge wire will reduce drastically i know you are very experienced you may not need it at all but uh, any time i'm struggling with opening so once i have done the cut uh, osteotomy cut and i'm struggling to open the osteotomy that means i know either the bone is uh, slightly osteoporotic i haven't released my mcl properly and uh, i'm worried there might be a hinge crack or hinge fracture then i'll put a hinge pin generally i don't use a hinge pin for every patient i use it specifically when i'm struggling with opening otherwise uh, it becomes quite easy to open the osteotomy with a laminar spreader just after doing your bone cut okay so we can move on. yes rajiv you have got a question rajiv yeah. uh, dr bhushan when do you start destruction is the day one or do you start close your osteotomy when you are using external fix and start destruction later on after two weeks so um, i'm a wrong person to speak to about external fixator i don't do them generally speaking i just done three or four till now but i think it's uh, is better seven to start days, days. yeah it's better seven to start days. destruction after five to seven days seven because days you want the soft tissue to heal so it's like the elizaro concept you leave it for uh, a week, uh, 10 days and then start gradually distracting but uh, i have seen patients crazily opening their osteotomy just because they think they can tolerate it and they just go crazy and berserk about the osteotomy opening so i think it's better to keep the control in our hands and not giving it to the patients never before 7 days is my theory yeah. Yeah. am i correct susan yeah i think 5 to 7 days i see but 7 yeah. days is a good number it's just like the rule of corticotomy <laughs> yeah you're right same for the osteotomy yeah yeah the same rule yeah sanjay sanjay is in the panel as well sanjay just a last question which has come up uh, uh, you can unmute yourself sanjay what is sanjay the, yeah sanjay yeah sanjay the question is that when you do an osteotomy with a root repair how do you modify your tunnel for the root repair do you modify your tunnel position it may not come in between osteotomy so for the osteotomy if patient is having chronic root tear i just do only osteotomy and i don't attempt a root repair at all okay and if patient is having at least more than 5 to 7 degree varus and patient is young fresh root tear and if that same degree of varus exists in the opposite limb also i will do only root repair and not the osteotomy in those patients okay. but when i have to i have to do both combine i would pass my suture first do the osteotomy and i will just provisionally fix it and then proximal to the osteotomy i will get my sutures out fix it and then 
complete the fixing of the osteotomy. But you would modify the place of uh, your uh, entry of. Of course, time. of course, we need to modify. But in root repair, that is the advantage that you can choose your point of fixation. It just have to be on the cortical side. Alternatively, if patient is thin and lean. you can use all inside anchor suture for this uh, particular situation but sometimes angle is odd and for that you uh, i have tried and use metallic anchor so that you can just uh, you know push it in and once you have put the anchor from the posterior medial portal anteriorly you can start suturing you can retrieve the suture anteriorly and then there is a normal suture passage so that's another alternative if it is too uncomfortable uh, you are uncomfortable with the osteotomy and anterior uh, entromedial tibia cortical uh, tunnel or fixation so how does it happen so first you make your tunnel for your root repair then you do an osteotomy first you pass suture first you pass suture suture with the meniscus root and then you leave it under the portal and then okay. you do osteotomy osteotomy okay. and after you have done osteotomy provisionally fix it and then you uh, uh, do the, the root repair tunnel. tunnel yeah and then root repair tie. tunnel and finally you are going to tie the root repair suture tie the root repair and then fix the uh, finish the osteotomy sachin oh, uh, what's sachin. the take of rajesh you want to add anything on that sachin any any trick on that because sachin is searching for something because he is definitely going to give some trick No, 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 no trick. I was just trying to find that paper so that I could share it with you. Yeah. So I agree with uh, what all has been said, and uh, probably that's the same trick that I still follow as well. Okay, thank you. Rajesh, as well, you do the same. You also do a lot of uh, HTOs. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, I do a lot of combined HTO with root repairs, and of late, I have a series of ten patients with HTO, ACL, and root repair, all three in one. Which I followed up for about two years now, and I think I'll wait till five years and then publish the results. That if we have any good results. Such as in one results. of in one of your cases, you had done an open wedge. Sorry. You are one of the cases which you showed. You did an open wedge osteotomy, uh, a closed wedge lateral osteotomy. Yes, correct. So why did you do that? Because uh, this was an ACL deficient knee. He was a smoker, and when you do a lateral closing wedge, you always decrease the slope. So it was best of both worlds uh, for okay. me. That's perfect, why. Perfect. Yeah. So I think let's go to Clement. Clement is uh, yes. Clement is waiting. Waiting. Yeah. yeah. Clement. Uh, this is going to be a practical talk. Am I clear? Yes. Clement, just part of you of AC AC joint. Now you are again in the pedal of fever. Rub shoulder to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just learning here. So, uh, as Sachin rightly pointed out, we can have tunnel vision and can uh, forget about patellofemoral joint when you have an obvious medial joint osteoarthritis. In addition to the typical patellofemoral pain we know that comes with stair climbing, squatting, and sitting and getting up, patellofemoral pain can also uh, aggravate uh, when you are walking. Many times when you do a taping, the walking pain also gets uh, improved. and uh, it can produce pain in different areas for example the daily textbook says the commonest cause of popliteal pain is a patellofemoral pain it can have a medial pain so it can relate to many places and whenever you see an obvious varus deformity don't forget about patella and most importantly patellofemoral pain can be produced by a normal patellofemoral joint it's a non structural pain and many structural problems like osteoarthritis still shift and overload can produce what is known as structural pain when it comes to patellofemoral don't forget to examine the patella in a obvious case of medial joint osteoarthritis you have to look for tilt mobility crepitus lateral patella pain and tendon points around the patella look for abrasion tracking and don't forget that the patella pain can radiate to popliteal and medial joint surfaces as well Once you always look for the tracking on the left side, you can see a nice J sign that indicates uh, lateral instability. And whenever you assess a patient of medial joint osteoarthritis, look for patellofemoral OA and determine whether uh, the medial joint is the main symptom or the patellofemoral joint is the main problem. And also, whenever you are doing high tibial osteotomy, always think. that uh, whether the hbl osteotomy can aggravate the patellofemoral pain we'll talk about this later 
So in my uh, practice, I have this kind of working classification to let me decide what I want to add to these patients with uh, early arthritis. Uh, basically, we can group all the patellofemoral pain patients into these three symptoms. One is a lateral pressure syndrome and a global pressure where there is tenderness both in the lateral aspect of the pedal as well as in the medial facets. And also in this group, we have the diffuse isolated petalofemoral OA as well. And the third would be cartilage defects. Let's go to this uh, lateral pressure syndrome. Usually it is produced by a tight lateral retinoculum. It can be characterized by the presence of lateral osteophytes and lateral wear of the petalofemoral joint. Basically, in these conditions, you may want to unload the lateral facet. A lot of times, taping can improve the pain and it also indicate how much of improvement the patient is going to have following surgical procedures for the lateral pressure syndromes, which are typically lateral release, lateral retinacular lengthening, and partial lateral facetectomy. In young patients and significant pain, you can also add a tibial tuberosity antromedialization as described by Fulkerson. Coming to the middle group where there is a diffuse pain syndrome, petal is diffusely involved. Uh, if it is due to overuse, a period of rest and rehab, some injections may help. But if it is due to osteoarthritis, sometimes when you're doing an osteotomy, you may want to just do a peripetalous synovectomy to take out uh, something, do something like a denervation and do debridement of um, uh, irregular uh, cartilage wear and fissures, etc. And there has been an attempt by a few people to combine a tibial tuberosity anteriorization along with uh, opening with osteotomy, which we'll see later. And coming to the third group where you have a cartilage defects, so this group usually tends to be very young people. And whenever you see a cartilage defect in the patella reported in MRI, don't jump into uh, dealing with the defects because these defects are usually because of some other pathology. It could be an acute trauma or it could be the result of a maltracking or instability. So it's very important in this group that you identify and correct the underlying problem. And then you can add a cartilage repair like uh, BMAC or uh, ACI. And if the defects are on the lateral and inferior pole, these lateral and inferior pole lesions respond very well to the Fulkerson osteotomy. The medial lesions they don't respond very well to antromedialization. So this is an overall working approach to dealing with petrofemoral problems in a young arthritic knee. So most importantly, even if you don't pick up any surgical points, I want to emphasize that you learn this taping. The taping uh, is done by the physician. I always keep the tapes under my uh, table. You can see I'm just using the normal fixomal tape, which uh, we use for uh, dressing. A strip is uh, applied extending from the lateral part of the petal to the hamstring area. And usually the tape is divided into three portions. The first portion is applied on the lateral uh, petal margin. And uh, then the petal is pushed medially. And also the middle portion of the tape is, is to pull it medially and then applied. And the last third of the tape is applied without any pull on the tape. So this will prevent skin blisters. And we take a similar length of tape once again and uh, slightly inferior to the first tape covering the entire patella is applied in the same fashion. If the patient has got at least 40% improvement after application of the tape, it confirms the diagnosis of the uh, lateral pressure syndrome. And these patients usually improve with uh, this kind of a weekly taping where I leave the tape for three, four days and the pain improves. Once the pain improves, the VMO starts functioning in a better way and these people have very good improvement. And this is a, just a modification of the tape. Uh, it's called a C taping, just run through it. I, in this case, I add a vertical tape also, which extends from the lower third of the leg and uh, crossing the lateral margin of the petal, pushing it medially. And then we apply the horizontal tapes as well. So these are the patient which, who was brought in a wheelchair. And after applying this tape, she was able to walk on her own. So this is a fantastic technique. I think every surgeon who is treating young arthritic knee should use it. It's a diagnostic tool. It can, on its own right, it can help improving the pain situation. And it is also a good prognosticator that your lateral procedures are going to work very well. And we also had a lot of VMO stimulation following the taping. Coming to the lateral pressure syndrome surgical intervention, the first case example we'd see is a patient 
uh, actually she underwent uh, cartilage repair and osteotomy four years back. Now she comes with uh, right knee virus and right knee pain. On clinical examination, the entire pain is coming from the petrofemoral joint on the lateral aspect, but the MRI was uh, not remarkable and it did, did not report any cartilage anomaly. Uh, we tried with uh, interventions like aspirations and uh, taping. Taping improved the pain. So we advised her osteotomy and uh, accommodate process. She was not willing for osteotomy, so we had to do a diagnosis for P to address the, the petrofemoral problem. Obviously, she had uh, medial osteophytes and medial cartilage wear, and petrol was essentially looking normal. And you can see here a lot of peripetalous synovitis, and which in its own right is a cause of pain. When you're doing ding arthritic knee, the peripetalous synovitis is a cause of patellar pain. And you can see the lateral gutter is fully filled up with uh, synovitis, which is uh, removed with a shaver here. And here you can see uh, the softening of the cartilage. You can see the entire lateral facet was soft. I didn't know what to do, so I used a radio frequency just to shrink the cartilage. And then to unload this uh, soft cartilage, we added a lateral retinocular uh, release as well. You can see this is a, like a blister. And you can see even after shrinking, the entire cartilage is uh, pretty soft. And if I opened it up, probably the entire lateral facet would have opened. So just stopped uh, uh, with the RF shrinking and lateral release. Patient had good improvement that but uh, after three weeks, we had to do, uh, because of the repeated efficiency uh, and the coronavirus, she came uh, that she wanted to get it done before the lockdown. So we had to do this BMAC repair and osteotomy. Coming to the next procedure, the lateral release is, uh, uh, is a very useful procedure, but nowadays a lot of people prefer lateral retinacular lengthening because uh, of its advantages. So here you can see the retinacular limb is divided in two layers, a superficial layer divided close to the patella and the deep layer divided two centimeter um, lateral to the patella and then uh, the knee is bent to 85 degree and these two layers are sutured. So this has got its own because it allows you an opportunity to look inside the joint and clear the synovium here. You can do a peripetalar and neurotomy, and you can also remove painful osteophytes in this case. So this is a patient with severe petrofemoral pain, uh, 61 years, and you can see the video here. And this patient had a previous uh, lateral retinacular release open uh, three years ago, which gave on the opposite knee, which gave a good improvement. Here, we didn't release, we opted for lengthening. Here you can see the superficial layer of retinaculum being close, uh, dissected off the deep layer. And the dissection is carried out uh, to nearly uh, two centimeter from the petal margin. So dissection is being carried out here. And then the orthotomy is done there. So it gives an opportunity for you to clear the synovium there. And if there are some osteophytes, you can uh, remove the osteophytes with a nibbler or a saw. Here you can see I'm removing the, uh, removing the synovium, which can itself be a source of pain. And osteophytes are being removed with uh, a nibbler. You can do uh, some kind of a neuro neurotomy also with your radio frequency device. So after this, the knee is bent at 85 to 90 degree and both the layers are sutured. So this procedure uh, uh, not only releases the lateral tight structures, but also ensures that there is a balance between the medial and uh, uh, lateral structures. The next uh, procedure which uh, may help uh, you when you're dealing with petrofemoral pain in an arthritic knee is a partial lateral pistectomy. So this is a uh, uh, petrofemoral syndrome pain cycle. Uh, tight structures can produce lateral retinacular shortening and they can lead to medial retinacular strain and medial joint pain. Lateral facet could be compressed leading to facet articular damage and a lateral osteophyte. And uh, you can see here uh, one of the patients undergoing osteotomy uh, very prominent osteophytes. You can also clear uh, irregular uh, cartilage bumps on the trochlea, and the anterior surface of the petla is exposed. Nearly a centimeter of bone is being sawed off from the lateral facet. So that's uh, the procedure. 
And a lot of studies have shown uh, good results in more than 70% of people uh, being followed up for five to 10 years of time. Basically, the pain uh, improves because the impinging osteophyte is removed, unloading the lateral facet. And we are also doing some kind of uh, retinacular lengthening, which relaxes the lateral, lateral surfaces, and the lateral retinaculum is also denervated in this procedure. Coming to the next procedure is a uh, patella cartilage repair. Uh, this is a 30-year-old patient with severe pain referred to me with uh, MRI findings suggestive of uh, cartilage damage and petal alta. Before I advised surgery, I put her for a rehab program for nearly three months. But when he came for, when she came for surgery, most of the pain had gone actually. So initial plan was to do a cartilage repair with uh, distillation osteotomy because the pain was uh, very much improved. We stuck with uh, just a diagnostic a scopy and cartilage repair. So these are the tricks one may want to know if you are doing an arthroscopic cartilage repair for petula. And uh, this is a setup uh, where two uh, three liter bottles are drained of saline, filled with air, and there is a TRP set with a uh, trocar inside, which is connected to an ordinary BP cuff here. So this will ensure that the joint is distended using air. And this is a BMAC a double loader syringe with a BMAC and fibrin and a thromine on the other side. And here you can see a trick here. I put some adibone switches onto the anterior periosteum of the uh, petal through the skin. And this uh, adibone switches here allow me to distract uh, the petal when I'm doing the cartilage repair. And if you want, uh, you can put one on each of the facets to tilt whatever way you like. And this is a picture of diagnostic scopy. Once you debride the cartilage lesion in this particular case, uh, you can see a big cartilage defect is there. And uh, normally uh, doing a micro fracture will be difficult for this petal lesion. So I use a round burr like this to debride the bone and remove the calcified cartilage. The margins are stabilized by a radio frequency probe. And this is the defect we have here. And uh, this is a video. This is an air orthoscopy, and the petal is retracted by the ethibone sutures, you can see. And the trick is to leave the blood clot uh, for a few seconds inside the needle. The clotting actually takes place in the needle. So you have to wait for uh, 20 to 30 seconds after the drop comes out of the needle, then inject sequentially. Then you can see a nice clot being formed as you uh, push the BMAC outside. And with the help of the needle, you can nicely mold it all around the defect and because she had very good improvement we didn't do any osteotomy in this case and uh, this is the um, result this is three years follow and uh, she has sent me yesterday just for this talk here so what i mean to say is even if there is a petal alta a good amount of rehabilitation and uh, uh, relevant procedures is uh, helpful in this particular case and always wait uh, for the rehab to work in these patients before you jump into doing the surgery the next procedure which i would like to show is a tibial to grossity transfer for uh, this girl and uh, this is a maquette osteotomy in which the tibial tuberosity was uh, anteriorized by more than 20, but it had its own complications, which was modified by Fulkerson, in which he incorporated the principles of Mache and elm Citria by shifting the tibial tuberosity both uh, medially and anteriorly by the use of an oblique osteotomy. By changing the various, uh, by changing the angle to more oblique, you can actually uh, play with this uh, procedure if you want more medialization as you would want in a case of petal instability, or you want more anteriorization as you would want in a case of petalofemoral pain. Once again, you have to remember this full cousin osteotomy and remedialization works very well in inferior pole lesions and lateral facet lesions. It's not a good solution for medial facet lesions in the petal arm. So it's very important uh, to know this, uh, this, it works in lateral and inferior positions. Uh, you can address petal alta as well as lateral tracking. And it's very important that you use two or three screws to fix the osteotomy. A bicortical fixation is very important. Counter sinking is very important to minimize the irritation on the skin and uh, careful rehabilitation is also very important. Uh, this is a, a case, uh, this is my uh, staff nurse working in my uh, hospital. It was done, I think, four years ago. Uh, she has terrible pain. She used to cry with pain. She can't even climb the stairs. And uh, then uh, she obviously had this uh, petla alta and uh, petla hypermobility. She did not have any documented episodes of uh, instability. So we went ahead and uh, 
did uh, NPFL reconstruction along with the tibial degrossity. These are the steps. Uh, longitudinal incision here, identify the patellar tendon, and you have to uh, uh, elevate nearly six to seven centimeter of the tibial degrossity. And you have to put wires, parallel wires, to guide your osteotomy and also guide your angle of osteotomy. And uh, here we go, osteotomy. And then if you want to dislice, you can remove uh, 8 to 9 millimeter of bone from uh, the tibia. And then the entire tibial tuberosity can be shifted down and fixed onto the bed of the tibia. So here you can see. So we have a video also. So this is a midline incision. So it's very important to identify the patellar tendon and then pass a tape under the patellar tendon. And the next step would be to expose the anterolateral aspect around the tibial tuberosity to reflect all the anterolateral muscle attachments so that you can see the exiting point of your K wire. And the intended distal point is marked. And then multiple K wires, parallel K wires are um, placed under the tibial tuberosity to guide the osteotomy. And before you start the osteotomy, the first hole for the screw is uh, drilled and the countersunk. And then the osteotomy is started with a small star, saw. The distal cut is being made. And then with the help of a larger saw, the osteotomy can be completed across. And with the help of an osteotom, uh, tuberosity is released on all sides, then mobilized. Because you are going to bring down, it's important to release the tibial tuberosity uh, medially and laterally. And uh, these are the cuts for distalization here. As you can see, eight to nine millimeter of bone is removed from uh, the tibia and the tibial tuberosity is brought down and fixed on the bed with a K wire. And now, the tibial tuberosity is shifted or rotated anteromedially, and then the far cortex of the first hole is uh, drilled. And uh, you can see a cortical screw is uh, applied. It's very important to use only two or three fingers to tighten the screw so as not to break the tibial tuberosity fragment. The second screw hole is drilled and fixed with a screw. Then you can see a good stability as well as good distillation has been achieved. It's very important to check for bicortical fixation using a C-arm here, the follow-up x-rays. And coming to the role of petrofemoral OEA in osteoarthritis, actually the medial opening wedge osteotomy may not be that good for your petrofemoral disease. Uh, studies have shown if you're doing uh, uh, opening wedge osteotomy, especially more than five degrees correction, it can result in increased petrofemoral pressure and it can decrease the height of the petla resulting in a petla baha. And uh, the petrofemoral scores uh, uh, usually fare poorly along with uh, an opening uh, high tibial osteotomy. So some people have tried to uh, address both the issues of uh, medial joint OA and petrofemoral OA by combining a dual osteotomy, which opens uh, on the medial side of tibia as well as anteriorizes the uh, tibial tuberosity. Some people have also described an hybrid osteotomy in which uh, a lateral closing wedge osteotomy is done along with the medial opening component. Uh, they say that uh, this type of osteotomy do not change the height of the patellar tendon. And finally, a descending biplane osteotomy instead of uh, the second plane going above the tibial tuberosity, uh, some others have done uh, this kind of a descending osteotomy where uh, the osteotomy second plane is taken down so that the tibial tuberosity along with the patellar tendon stays with the proximal segment. And this usually doesn't affect the petrofemoral uh, femoral loading uh, pressures or patellar tendon height. So rehab is very important to sum up, uh, always address the weak muscles. So in this case, mostly they'll be hip flexors, external rotators and abductors. And VMO has to be strengthened, but without overloading the petrofemoral joint and muscle electrical stimulation is very, very important. Usually the tight structures would be hamstring, cordyceps, hypertrophy band and pedal retinoculum. One has to focus uh, uh, all these concepts when you are rehabilitating these patients. To conclude, uh, petrofemoral 
uh, issues can actually alter the outer outcome of your uh, atypical osteotomy. If you neglect uh, significant patellofemoral pain when you are addressing middle joint oste osteoarthritis, uh, these patients can be unhappy. One should uh, remember it could be structural as well as non-structural lesions, proximal causes. Uh, like muscle poor muscle control should be addressed before you do an osteotomy in these cases. Uh, don't jump in to treat cartilage damage unless you know why this cartilage damage has taken place. Gimmicks uh, like PRP stem cell will not work. Clinical evaluation is the key and working diagnosis and a planned approach is very, very important to have a good report, good uh, results in these cases. Uh, once again, thanks uh, uh, a lot for uh, uh, listening and thank uh, Tanmay and Sornendu for the opportunity to share my thoughts on federal government problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clement. This was just too much, too good. Too good one. Any okay. question? Yeah, Clement, there's a guess, question guess, here. Yeah, yeah. Questions. So questions are coming. Uh, Clement, uh, a very important question here. Uh, normally in a patellofemoral arthritis, you do have a trochlear lesions, which are also quite important. Okay. The trochlear notch lesions. So what we are managing essentially is the patellar surface. But if okay. we have a kissing lesion, how exactly do you manage the trochlear lesions as well? Yeah, uh, the kissing lesions on the trochlear, I usually debride. Most of the time, I use a microfracture uh, chondroplasty in, in the setting of a high table osteotomy. I usually, unless you are prepared, I don't do uh, any cartilage repair for uh, trochlear lesions. I just uh, debride, cure it out, remove all the unstable fragments and do uh, microfracture. But doesn't it make sense because patella is essentially a mobile structure, but the okay. trochlear notch essentially is a static structure. Would you not do a cartilage transplant on the trochlear and just do a microfracture or maybe just a debridement on the patella? No, if I'm planned, I would do on both surfaces. Many times these lesions come across like a surprise during your osteotomy. So basically we don't have the means to do, but where uh, I've done uh, be my cartilage repair for trochlea also, in which cases I primarily go to do a petrofemoral uh, cartilage repair. So I'm prepared, everything is available, I have done it. But mostly these lesions will be a surprise to you when you're doing uh, your osteotomy. Yeah. Yes, Brajes, Brajes is waiting, Brajes. Uh, Dr. Clement, can we do radio frequency denervation for patellofemoral pain like we do in the uh, total knee replacement with the cautery? Can we do arthroscopic radio frequency denervation around the uh, patella? Yeah, I've done yeah, in new rectum. New rectum. New rectum. Uh, yep. You, you can do, we can do. Okay. But I'm not sure, I can't tell which one works because it's a multifactor. When you're doing osteotomy, uh, it, it all just agent procedures. But if you have any doubt and preoperatively you know that the patient has significant patellofemoral pain and you don't have any structural lesions on the patella or trochlea, you can do this peripatellar synovectomy and do a little bit of radio, uh, radio frequency ablation. Uh, Clement, this Rajiv. lateral patellar facet compression syndrome is quite uh, confusing still because people think there is an underlying malalignment which is actually causing a lateral uh, compression. So, how do you evaluate uh, these cases that you are just radio frequency or release or lengthening would uh, suffice? These it patients don't need uh, any adjoint procedure. Yeah, it depends on the type of patients you are uh, looking at. There is a young group of patients, less than 30, where you think more in terms of instability, uh, maltracking issues like that. Uh, in those cases, you may want to do a cartilage repair, you may want to do a distal realignment, all those things. But when it comes to uh, elderly group, like a medial joint, uh, OEA, undergoing osteotomy, you just want to unload that part. You don't uh, consider tibial tuberosity or anything. In the elderly group, like 45 to 55, you can add lateral retinacular lengthening, you can add fastectomy. Those things usually work, they are as good as tibial tuberosity transfer. But in an younger group, where you see lateral pain, lateral control wear, inferior pollutions, and you want to do something which works for a long time, in this group of patients. We are looking at a good uh, survival 30, 40 years. So those cases, young patients with the lateral lesions, lateral syndrome, you will do all your analysis, small tracking, uh, torsion analysis, all these things you do. So it depends on the patient uh, profile uh, you do. Rajiv, Rajiv, you are, Rajiv, yeah. Rajiv, you are telling something? Yeah. Clement, sir, how do you decide in lateral facectomy in open procedure? So, how much of lateral facet should be removed? 
I remove eight to nine millimeter, just short of a centimeter, I would say. So, and what I, 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 I have done? Yeah, please, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. So what, what I do arthroscopically, I just see and I put a mark by the radio frequency and then I open it so I get a marking here. I have to remove one centimeter. Sometimes it's more than one centimeter also. So, just yeah, what he is asking is how much of the lateral facet he is taking off? Yeah, that's okay. Me or Rajiv? Seven. IPS, can I ask question? Yeah, there is a question of doc, from Dr. Praful. He says, are there any vascular issues with patellar neurectomy? So is there an osteonecrosis seen after patellar neurectomy? No, no, no. What we do with RF is very, very minimal. Okay. Uh, the way the uh, total replacement, joint replacement guys are doing, a bit aggressive. I think uh, we are actually gentle. You know, we don't have to dig in too much. Uh, most importantly, the synovectomy, peripetal synovectomy mm -hmm. and uh, a superficial ablation. That's what I do. Dr. Raj Krishna wants to ask, is there an upper limit for BMAC for you and an upper limit for lesion as well, for BMAC for patellar lesions? Uh, um, it's not a very common uh, thing which I do day in and day out. Uh, I've done maximum uh, 1.5 centimeter by 2 centimeter. That's what the maximum. Yep. Okay. There is a question for panel, which means uh, Sanj uh, Sanjit Trivedi can answer. What are your thoughts about trochleoplasty and patellofemoral issues? So Sanjay, I think... I have trochlea. no experience actually. No trochlea. Uh, Sachin is doing trochleoplasty. Yeah. Sachin, how do you choose a patient for trochleoplasty in patellofemoral pain syndrome? Do you do it? Trochleoplasty for patellofemoral pain? Yeah, it's only for instability. Yeah, it's only if the patient yeah. is, uh, has got instability yeah. and the presence of chondral lesions is a contraindication to do trochleoplasty. Yeah, so that's a question which is answered. Uh, Dr. Ankit Varshne says, how do you check for tight lateral retinaculum and IT band tightness? How do you differentiate between a tight IT and a lat? Uh, how do you clinically check? So maybe uh, slim retinaculum is easily identified by the look of patella tilt, the patella facing the ceiling or on the corner of uh, this is a classical teaching corner of your wall. Okay. Okay, and then there is a tilt test where you stabilize the patella and try to uh, bring the patella to neutral with both your thumbs. If you are not able to bring the patella to the neutral position with your uh, tilting manual, that indicates uh, retinacular tightness. And then there will be lateral side of pain, and then there will be crepitus also. Coming to the IT band tightness, uh, you can't, uh, that's a different scenario actually. You can't, uh, there are obers just being described. Uh, I don't know whether it gives a consistent result for observers. Yeah. Uh, do the tapes which you put, patient can take a shower? No, these are the water resistant tapes. They are not waterproof tapes. And okay. uh, very important thing, these are the same fixomal tapes which are supplied by BSM. For this lateral pressure syndrome, you have to use a rigid tape. The kinesio tape, they don't work well. For okay. the jumpers, I use it. So it's a simple tape. You can use, don't use Danaplast tape. Always use a rigid tape. It has to be covered. What I do is I leave the tape for two, three days, the patient product from uh, water, and they remove it on their own. And then you tape without... it again yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, taping is just a temporary phenomenon. They say that uh, no, the taping, the patient the might need improved. surgery. No, the it... taping itself uh, will improve a lot of patients because once you, it's a vicious cycle. There is a pain, VMO weakness, VMO inhibition, more lateral pull. So it's a vicious cycle. You are, you are breaking the cycle, as, at least in young people, okay, with taping. Once you do the taping, you'll be surprised to see that they are able to walk, they are able to climb up and down the stair. And it is a self-taping. Now, normally my patients take the video of how to apply the taping. They take the, the second week onwards, they start doing by themselves. In around three or four weeks uh, time, there is a splendid improvement. And uh, especially in young people, 30 to 40, you don't actually uh, need to go to surgery at all. It itself is a curative uh, procedure because it, imp there is an ample number of studies which says that uh, the patellar taping improves the quality of firing. VMO firing, which is normally delayed in these cases, uh, improves with your patellar taping. So the VMO function is facilitated by your taping. I think I all the questions are answered. Tanmay has, has a case to share. Yeah, Tanmay. Yeah, yeah, Tanmay share. Yeah. Tanmay do it. Yeah, okay. So this, uh, this uh, case Tanmay is showing is open to all the panelists here. Yeah, so I would require uh, opinion of everyone there. Uh, 
So we still have 15 minutes and I think we'll finish with this case and then some conclusions, yeah. Yeah, I hope yeah. I can, you all can see the screen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, a it is, yeah. female with uh, complaints of bilateral knee pain more on the right side. So it, she had pain for almost a year, but then she had a twisting injury of uh, four months back, which uh, because of which the pain aggravated too much for her to bear then. And no relevant medical history, no comorbidities. And she had pain max on walking and on bending knee as well as on her daily activities, which was limiting her daily activities. And was, there was no locking. Then uh, on clinical exam, I would go and uh, say she had a BMI around 32, 33. I mean, then the right knee was more affected. So I took it at the, as that. There was effusion, there was joint line tenderness, there was crepitation on the knee movement, pedal femoral crepitus was there. Then the, there was, was mild virus landment on a single leg weight bearing. And range of movement was around 130 degrees. Patellar compression test, retropatellar tenderness was positive. Her patellar mobility was good. No ligamentous laxity as such. So I would ask the panel, how would you go about this case? So let's start with Dr. Sanjay Trivedi first. What all, uh, how, how shall we go ahead? Uh, can you just please tell, uh, I mean, what, what all investigations would you require in such a case? Sanjay, unmute yourself. Sanjay, bhai, unmute. Sorry, sorry. Right. So, um, sorry. She is a, a obese patient, 52. So, we need to establish what kind of, uh, you know, joint salvage procedure, or not salvage, joint preservation procedure we are going to offer her. So, we need a standing weight-bearing X-ray, full-length X-ray, and MRI of uh, this patient to have some idea. And... Uh, if there is, you said there is no instability, so there are no stress which required. So, do you have this? This, this, this is, is a full length. Yeah, this is the. This was the uh, full length. I forgot to add the entire single leg. But this was there was mild uh, virus to it. Yeah, and and some so patellofemoral. Unfortunately, I don't have this. Was before the COVID. I unfortunately I don't have the scanogram of the patient. I could not gather. Right, but uh, have you got any idea what is on this scanogram? What angle, roughly? And this is single leg weight bearing X-ray, you say? Yeah. And uh, there is some uh, patellofemoral arthritis also, which I can see. There is a posterior uh, osteophyte there. I have, the, I have the MRI pictures. Did, you... Right. So let us have MRI pictures. This is the MRI, the coronal images. Right. This is the sagittal. And this is the axial views. There is a bit of patellofemoral femoral changes in the uh, the axial views. There we can see a posterior meniscus root there. There, so this yep. is specific root there which we can see here. Then this is the exact yes. both sign. What we see, then there is an meniscal extrusion as you can see here. Right. So I would like the opinion of the house. How would you go about this? Would you preserve this joint? Would you go directly for, I mean, with an HTO or with a... Yeah, probably this is the right case, sir, which uh, 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 even Sanjay was telling. Sanjay, in this case where you have a, a root tear with varus and an osteo, uh, maybe a cartilage lesion there. So his Tanmay's question is basically, would you conserve it? Would you osteotomize it? Or would you combine a root repair with osteotomy? Uh, in this case, I'm, uh, you know, if this falls under the unicondylar category, I would be inclined to uh, offer her unicondylar rather than osteotomy and root repair kind of situation here. But uh, this is not a bone on bone scenario. And I think if I am not mistaking yeah. Sachin, yes. Sachin said, don't choose a which is not bone on bone. So, Sachin, <laughs> your, your take. <clears throat> 
So I think one we need to understand a few more things about this particular patient in question here. What is her BMI? Is she thirty-two? Thirty-two BMI. Is she well motivated? Does she? What are her metabolic parameters? And uh, you know what's her range and what's her overall pain bearing capacity? See, because when you are wanting to contemplate an osteotomy, there are certain rules which are not written in the books per se. Rules like you know, if you have someone who is uh, going to be one of those complaining types who is not going to be taking pain too much, then you do an osteotomy and then you're you know stuck with an unhappy patient for almost three to six months before they start becoming better. But uh, in this particular individual here, I see that the cartilage is uh, pretty well preserved. Uh, it is not uncommon for patients above the age of forty, forty-five to have such chondral changes on the MRI scan. If this patient did not have significant knee pain prior to this root repair happening, I would be exactly. inclined to suggest that uh, you know this is uh, she is someone uh, who was well compensated, and for this particular individual in question, of course, I have not examined this lady. But uh, my take would be to do an arthroscopy, see if the root is repairable, because I can see that the root is quite retracted. There's more than six to eight millimeters gap between the insertion point and where the root is. So I would counsel her that if the root is repairable, I'm going to repair it. If it is not repairable, I will not repair it. And depending upon the coronal plane alignment, I will go ahead and do an osteotomy. So Bhushan, would you also agree? Because uh, uh, combining an osteotomy would protect her root repair as well. Uh, it's just that the root is too far retracted, so it might be a very tight uh, root repair. Uh, osteotomy, of course, will be required for for this patient, uh, of course, depending on the various alignment. But unless you do an osteotomy, that root is not going to heal. Yeah, if you are so, struggling with yeah. the root repair, then you may not be may not uh, achieve a good root repair because it will be too tight or too tensed up, and the meniscal extrusion also is there. So I mm -hmm. I would be a bit more drastic. I would say uh, just do an arthroscopy, see if it's repairable. Ninety percent, I think this will not be repairable. Just do an osteotomy, and if you go back in six months' time, you might find the root is already healed. So uh, I may not even do a root repair. I'll just do an osteotomy to correct the alignment, and uh, you might be surprised six months down the line. But BMI is thirty-two. So Bhushan, does that bother you? I think it's thirty-two is still acceptable. Thirty-five plus, I will be a bit more finicky about this. Uh, she's not a patient for uni yet. She doesn't have a bone and bone arthritis. So either uh, you can give an offloader brace and wait for a uni compound knee replacement in due course of time. But if she's struggling with a normal day-to-day -day activities, including walking, I would like to intervene early and do an osteotomy now than anything else. Many IPS. times, uh, IPS, many yeah. times when we put scope inside in this yeah. kind of MRI picture and we have surprise in waiting because, uh, you know, Cartilage is not as healthy as we expect in obese female of 52. Yeah, that is also an important thing to consider. Yeah, I think so. You, uh, any the, the any chances of... take on uh, on this from anyone? Rajesh, Doctor Pratik, sir. Yeah, IPS. I, uh, IPS. I, I think yeah. from yeah. the MR picture that we, that we are seeing from this cart from this coronal image, I think this root is not repairable. There are two points here, uh, Tanmay. The root is very well retracted. There is a significant patellofemoral component also in the lateral facet, as we saw on axial images. So those will also have to be taken into consideration because ultimately yeah. they are also adding to the pain. So, right. I mean, just a, just a question here. Why not mm. just maybe aspirate it, inject steroid, and give her an unloader brace? Would that help? She's failed conservative treatment. That's what uh, Tanmay told us. So Tanmay, did you aspirate? Did you give us? No, I didn't aspirate. But then I had given her almost a, a month or so for offloading her from activities and everything with physio, with some stretching exercises of hamstrings and everything I had tried, whatever possible measures. But then she was reluctant and she came back to me that she wants some kind of intervention to go ahead with. So, so IPS, let's consider that you know uh, he's exhausted non-surgical treatment, and let's consider surgical treatment here. No, no. My my question is just that if unloader brace is not helping her, would osteotomy help her? So traditionally we give unloader brace, see how things are working. If it works, then we do osteotomy. Here the pain is because of the, because of, here the pain is not because of the varus. It is also because of the root tear. Root tear is giving you the maximum pain. 
No, but sir, root, is root is error is chronic, sir. It root is, is chronic. not repairable. It is not repairable. If you look into this root, it it is difficult but, to repair uh, this root. The pain is only because the root has torn. That's why the pain has increased. That's why the patient is unhappy with all sorts of treatment. Ushan, still you do an unloader trial before you take a patient for osteotomy. Osteotomy is a big operation. Patient needs to be cooperative with you for six months. She must understand that success would happen. So would you unload her and see how things happen and then take a decision? So it depends on how the leg looks. If it's a quite a fat obese lady and the leg is not a braceable leg. So there are these conical legs where no brace can fit. I think she might be one of those. You can see the fat envelope around the knee there. So she might be uh, someone who may not tolerate a brace as well. But you know the pathology. I think uh, she will be better off with an osteotomy. I would tell her there are two options. The moment you tear a root, that means your arthritis is going to progress faster with a various alignment on the medial side. So either she can have an, uh, she can take whatever painkillers, steroid injections, uh, uh, any kind of other injections you are keen on and any kind of braces that you can use and wait for a uni which can happen in about a year's time. Or we can work proactively and aggressively now and correct the alignment and she can have this knee for next 10, 15 years. So that's how I counsel my patients. I tell them if you can trial the brace for a week, if they can manage the brace, then continue using the brace and then see how they feel. So she's got significant bone marrow edema as well yeah. uh, on the medial tibia and probably that's where her pain is coming from. Mm. And because she's got, uh, we've not seen a skyline x-ray, but the axial sections do show lateral patellofemoral wear. So for me, a uh, partial knee is probably not a good option because the presence of advanced uh, lateral patellofemoral wear is a contraindication to do a uni. So either she's looking at an osteotomy, I, I mean, she's failed non-surgical treatment. So she's looking either at an HTO or she's looking at a TKR as far as I'm concerned. Uh, how significant was the pain the TKR or would you scope it first before going for an HTO? 100%. 100%. Always. I mean, Always. Scope, scope at the same time. Yeah. Scope, scope at the same time. time. Obviously, yeah. obviously at the same time, not for just for doing the scope itself. Okay, so I share what I did. These were the scope images I went on with the scope. These were the images. I can just share the video. There was profound uh, synovitis there with almost grade 4 pat uh, patellofemoral changes. Patella was already raw. Trochlea also had changes. Like, um, there was the ACL, PCL were okay. There was a significant way on the middle femoral condyle. The tibial condyle was pretty okay. The lateral compartment was also uh, absolutely kind and intact. There was had an intact cartilage. I've not included that in because of the shortness of time. There was the radial type two kind of a tear with an extrusion. So, looking at this, any changes in your uh, from the panel, so uh, Samantha sir, how would you go about it? So looking at I, the I I think you see the patellar component, patella has also been problematic. So, whatever you do, like my uni is out of question here, I will still go ahead with the uh, um, HTO. Just the HTO? You won't uh, repair the root? I think I have to check whether, we can, whether, whether it is repairable or not. Still, it is not. The MRI was, it was too far retracted, but the, mm -hmm. the scopy wise, it's not that retracted. I think, uh, uh, can I? Yes. Then, mate, I yes, think, yes, yes. Uh, so even the x-ray, even though there is no scanogram, I don't think is, this patient has got a severe virus or anything. I think it should be comparable to the both sides, maybe maybe the two or three degrees of virus. And she didn't have any previous pain too much. I mean, you know, she had some vague, vague pain. I think this, uh, the root, after the root tear only, she pain was uh, exaggerated. Exactly. But the, in this case of in this kind of grade two damage, still I would do only root repair and wait and watch. Most of them that do very well. So you won't, Sunda, you won't go with an HTO along with I, the root repair. I, I, if it is more than grade three, whereas then if it is less than that, uh, if it is less than grade two, 
sorry, two degrees or three degrees, I won't do an osteotomy in this patient because she didn't have any previous pain before. Only this traumatic event which increases the pain. If she's got a bilaterally the same two degrees of virus or three degrees of virus, still I would do only root repair. So fine. I need a quick one-line answer from all the panelists. So starting with uh, Sachin. Oh, what? What Your will take... I do? What will yes. I do? Yes. HTO with root repair. Fine. Uh, Dr. Patik. HTO root repair and also address patellofemoral area. I would go and debride that and maybe use RF to reduce the pain because some part of pain will be coming from there. Try root repair and then HTO. Dr. IPS? I think IPS, sir, has got exited by mistake. Okay. Uh, Dr. Clement? Yeah, you had to do HTO root repair, HTO followed by something for patella because a huge osteophyte is there. They'll be unhappy after HTO. Dr. Do. Trivedi? So you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, only HTO um, I would prefer in this lady. Okay. Uh, Dr. Brajesh? Uh, STO with root repair with the radio frequency for the patellofemoral uh, thing. Okay, so fine. I, anything else? I mean, anybody would like to add to this? I, anyways, finally uh, went on and did. Uh, she was. I prepared it for an uh, root repair along with an HTO. She wasn't quite ready for the HTO because when I told her all the precautions, everything, but then she wasn't uh, fully prepared. So I just went on and did a root repair along with a micro fracture for that condyle, middle femoral condylar fragment. That area which was a little raw and plus a radio frequency ablation around the patella along with synovial synovectomy, partial synovectomy for the exaggerated synovitis in the gutters what uh, Dr. Clement was ex exactly telling. So this, uh, that's what I finally did. How's the outcome, Tarmine? She's doing fine as of now. Well, uh, I just had uh, some uh, video consultation with her. Then this, after the lockdown, I could not follow her up. Mm -hmm. This I did almost uh, 20, 25 days before the lockdown. She's doing fine and as of now. How's in the... Sundar said, even a lot of uh, patients do well, even without an HTO, they do well. But yes, of course, if the, the virus is more, uh, you have to, HTO is an added benefit. But then there are patients uh, where there is a lot of patients who are around 45 or maybe even less than 45, but they are very obese and they have this bone and bone disease. Any take for that? Would, uh, Dr. Sachin, is, if you are still online, would you still go and do a uni for that? So if there is bone on bone disease, I would not be too happy to do an HTO for her. And then depending upon the status of the patellofemoral joint, I would discuss with her, counsel her and do a totally replacement if her patellofemoral joint, the lateral patellofemoral joint is affected. If the medial patellofemoral joint is affected, I will do a uni. No, not this case. Any other case, there's a question from... Yeah, yeah. any case. For any case for that matter. Even age, age is no bar? Age is no bar, not at all. Okay. Tanmay. Yes. So I think I think consensus of this thing we can form one thing that if there is a bone and bone, I think your H two A is not at all going to work anyway. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It is not at all work because this will be total failure and your your TKR will be complicated after H two A even. I know no, we are uh, expert in the TKR in H two O, but this is a complicated surgery. Uh, there is a question here by Doctor Praful. Anyone would do a proximal fibular osteotomy if virus is correctable? No, yes, you don't do that. Don't do Bhushan, that. Bhushan does PFO. So Bhushan, your answer, please. PFO. Bhushan, unmute Proximal yourself. Fibular. Uh, proximal fi fibula. Proximal fibula. 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 Yes. He asked for the fibula. Have, yeah. yeah so I, I've, I've been in fights with a lot of people over this. So uh, I don't believe in this procedure. Yes, it does. It has shown uh, uh, in various biomechanical studies to reduce the forces on the medial side. So it can be a good stopgap thing for uh, maybe a few months or maybe a maximum a year or so. I don't think it will cure your arthritis in any way. It doesn't play any role in managing the alignment. It does reduce the chances of knee subluxation. That's the only advantage in my opinion. So uh, something which doesn't make sense to me, I will not venture into that. So 
not for, yes. not my cup of yeah, tea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The main attraction of this forum from from this forum at least we should tell that proximal fibular osteotomy we don't recommend from our forum. I, yeah, yeah, he said so. A uh, question from Dr. Vanaj Kumar: Which brace do you advise for medial offloading? So, anybody who does conservative treatments, which type of brace would you? It's a yeah. joint brace or is it a what kind no. of brace? Can Depends on your patient's it? budget, actually. Yeah. Uh, so, but is an Indian company which makes it a nice one? No, I I, no. So no. I normally use the Osser one, which is the costliest one. But uh, it, it essentially depends on on your patient. Uh, I think a Donjo and Osser both are quite good. I haven't tried the uh, the Visco variant yet. Uh, so, question. Yeah, question. I think who is asking? Yes, question. Uh, Bushan, uh, Brick yeah. Freestyle. You know, there is a yeah. company called freestyle. Brick from Brick. Yeah, you... Brick and Rob. Oh, sorry, sorry, Clement. I forgot to mention Brick. So I use three braces: either Brick, uh, Donjo, or uh, uh, yeah, it's quite affordable. Thing. Yeah, it is 16, 17,000 something. So it's quite good. Clement, in uh, in patellofemoral problems also, would you, instead of taping, sometime would advise a brace for uh, centralizing the patella well? Clement. Clement is, I think, here, his uh, internet is not working. Okay, okay. I think so. Uh, Tanmay, are there any more questions coming? Because I see. Oh, as such, I can't see any more on the channel. Yeah, so no I'm more already, questions. Already, already, already we have six six minutes past six here. No worries. I think let's uh, uh, conclude quickly before thank we. Thank you, everyone. We must thank, thank you all. Thank uh, you. Uh, I think, I think Sachin, Sachin must conclude the whole what are the take home messages from today's meeting. Sachin, you please give, give the one, two, three, four like your Guru Mantra. Okay, so I think uh, if I have to make any concluding remarks, it will be that firstly, as a knee surgeon, you have to be well trained and you should understand the limitations and the advantages of joint preservation as well as joint replacement. Both of these surgical techniques have their own place. It is not HTO versus UKR. It is HTO and UKR. And you should also learn to respect the intraarticular structures. There are very good techniques to preserve and heal the cartilage as well as repair the meniscus. And lastly, take each patient as he comes. It's not just what the long leg standing films or the stress x-rays or your MRI scan shows. A lot is dependent on the personality of the patient, the BMI, his overall sort of stature, what his mentality is. And based on that, you have a repertoire of techniques at your disposal, which you can use effectively in your practice to ensure that the patient has the best possible outcome. Yeah, and Sachin, please I share that uh, osteomaster detail with us so that we can send it on uh, IES WhatsApp group so that okay, everybody I'll, knows I'll, about the work. I will, yeah, I will just forward it to you, IPS. Yeah. So you can then forward it to everybody. So that would be good. Uh, Tanmay, if you can just thank I, I, everybody. IPS, you can conclude the meeting and Tanmay. Please conclude, sir, IPS, sir. Yeah, so IPS, I think sir. Sachin has already given uh, take-home points and I think it was a wonderful uh, meeting. Our next meeting is on multi-ligament uh, reconstruction. It's basically a case-based scenario, which is on 24th. Uh, Dr. Denshaw is uh, leading the meeting and he's going to present some multi-ligament case scenarios and I think it, it should be very helpful for our members. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Clement. Uh, thank you, Bhushan Sapnes. Thank you, Sanjay Trivedi, uh, uh, Sachin, and Brijesh uh, for joining the panel. And Tanmay, uh, uh, thank you, Tanmay, for coordinating and arranging it uh, such wonderfully. We are right on time. Samantha, thank you for all the help and all the EC members. Thank you very much.